introduction. So I'm really excited to lead a roundtable discussion for some viewpoints on medical devices in the Internet of Medical Things with some representatives from the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Civil Rights, and also from the FDA. So first I want to give uh, just some brief background on our panel members. First, Devin McGraw serves as the Deputy Director for Health Information Privacy at the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights, and she's also the active, uh, Acting Chief Privacy Officer for the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. Now, Devin has a wealth of experience in both the private sector and also the nonprofit world. Prior to joining the HHS, she was a partner in the healthcare practice of Manit, Phelps, and Phillips. She served as the director of the health privacy projects at the Center for Democracy and Technology and was Chief Operating Officer at the National Partnership for Women and Families, where she provided strategic leadership and substantive policy expertise for the partnership's health policy agenda. We also have Linda Ritchie. Linda began her career developing artificial intelligence solutions in the defense industry before moving to the medical device industry as a software engineer. Linda helped to develop several diagnostic cardiology devices, and she's participated in all phases of product life cycle development. Linda joined the FDA in 2005, and she's had several roles, including scientific reviewer and branch chief within the Division of Cardiovascular Devices. Currently, Linda's the Associate Director for Digital Health within the Office of Device Evaluation, where she leads the development and implementation of digital health policy. So I'm so excited to have you both here, and I have a lot of questions to uh, cover in 25 minutes. I'll get through as many as I can. I'll alternate initial questions to a specific panel member, and then, you know, the other one, if you want to offer any additional thoughts, that will be great. So, Devin, I'm going to start with you. So, over the past several years, I've had dozens, uh, maybe even hundreds of medical device manufacturers and vendors tell me that they certainly are not considered to be business associates under HIPAA because they are governed by the FDA and not the Department of Health and Human Services. However, many and perhaps most of these have direct access into the system, such as in the hospitals, clinics, home care settings, and so on, that control the devices and can update the software, make changes to settings, access the data, and so on. So since they have this direct access to the medical device data to perform a service in support of patient treatment care and operations, it would seem to make them business associates. Um, and the type of breaches that could occur through those medical device vendors and manufacturers could be significant, especially since the pathways also go into the networks, associated resources, and so on. So how are you handling this type of situation? Have you had many questions about whether or not medical device vendors and manufacturers are business associates under HIPAA? Rebecca, we get this question all the time, as you can imagine. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and, and the fact of the matter is, is that uh, the answer really is, it depends. Um, whether or not you are a covered entity or a business associate, and business associate in particular, really uh, depends on what you're doing. So let me just say um, at the outset that there are device manufacturers who may in fact be covered entities because the definition of a healthcare provider under HIPAA um, includes, for example, durable medical equipment suppliers and other types of de uh, oftentimes device vendors who uh, have provider numbers under Medicare and are billing. 
uh, whether it's public programs or private sector programs. And in fact, we had a case that settled uh, earlier this year against um, a company that was a manufacturer of uh, mobile uh, monitoring systems for uh, cardiac arrhythmias. So it, it, it isn't as though the, the question of whether a device manufacturer is a covered entity is off the table. In fact, in some cases, the manufacturers themselves may be directly covered by our rules. Now, whether or not they're a business associate is, is not just about whether they have access to the PHI, but whether what they are doing is a, performing a function or service on behalf of the covered entity or in the case of a subcontractor or to a business associate, which does happen to that business associate. This is really a function of the fact that HIPAA covers covered entities and the contractors who work with them and perform services for them. So whether or not a, a device manufacturer or a vendor is going to be a business associate is really very much dependent on whether uh, they meet the test of providing a service or a function to the covered entity. And that's why they're accessing PHI. There are lots and lots of places where there is a company involved in the treatment of the patient or an individual involved in the treatment of the patient, but where they're both involved in the treatment of the patient and one isn't, and, and the entity, the, the, the device manufacturer, for example, is not acting on behalf of the covered entity, but is part of the treatment team, right? I mean, we do say very clearly under our rules that, a covered entity can share information for treatment purposes, and it doesn't necessarily have to be to a covered entity or even another business associate, right? So it's, it's very facts and circumstances based. So if there are device manufacturers out there that are telling you, well, I'm not a business associate, you know, the answer to that question is, well, maybe, maybe not, right? Depends. And frankly, they may be business associates for some lines of business and not for others. Ah, that's a great point, and it, uh, I think you, uh, what you just said really points out context matters, and so there's not an easy uh, answer to that question. Everybody has to, to do some logical thinking processes for their particular situations. It, yes, um, that's right. Great, great. So uh, then, Linda. Uh, speaking of having folks, you know, the, the medical devices and whether or not they're doing certain things with the medical devices, uh, the FDA has released a variety of cybersecurity guideline documents for medical devices. And one of the ones that has gotten a lot of, of publication or a lot of press is the post-market management of cybersecurity in medical devices document. And I've had a lot of folks when they saw that you were going to speaking, they wanted to know, well, how widely are those recommendations actually being implemented or is the FDA following uh, those types of, of statistics to see how many are actually putting them to use or if there's plans to put them to use by medical device vendors and manufacturers. And I guess personally too, I would, I'm curious to know, is the use of the, the, that particular document and your others that you put out meeting your hopes or expectations? Ah, thank you very much for that question. Um, certainly the security and the cybersecurity management for medical devices uh, is all about um, maturing and starting, you know, where we were 10 years ago and trying to get to where we want to be is a process. Uh, we definitely see that different manufacturers have different levels of maturity. There are going to be manufacturers that uh, absolutely um, follow most of the recommendations uh, within the post-market management uh, guidance and do it well and manage their vulnerabilities, manage the security of their devices very well. They've built in the security and they know what to do to make sure that their devices remain secure in the post-market. Uh, certainly there is going to be manufacturers that um, are not as mature as others. Um, and just like the uh, security as a whole uh, involves an active adversary that is, is changing, um, which means that, you know, we constantly have to keep our systems updated. 
we also expect that manufacturers to continue to evolve. So even if you are uh, absolute, you know, the gold star today, we expect that you will continue to need to evolve um, and, and grow as the field grows and changes. Um, we also see that uh, that is true for the FDA as well. You know, we've put out um, uh, these uh, two guidances, the pre-market and the post-market, um, in the past several years. We don't expect that this is going to be the end of what we say about cybersecurity. We know that the field changes, and we know that um, uh, the maintaining security will change as time goes on, and we expect that um, just like we expect for manufacturers that our um, oversight may change over time, that you know, the, our recommendations may change over time. Um, and we see this as um, an ecosystem, and we all grow together and to uh, help the entire ecosystem be more secure. Well, and that's a great point, especially after uh, listening to Katina talk about all the emerging types of devices that people are, are starting to use. I anticipate, like you mentioned, you're going to be very busy uh, in the coming years with all these new types of technologies being implemented in medical devices as time goes on. So pe people be better uh, monitor your site pretty closely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, okay, great. Well, we have another question then um, for Devin. Have, has the OCR, uh, Office of Civil Rights, have they done many or any HIPAA audits or reviews or investigations of medical device vendors or plan to, or if not any of those planned audits, uh, do you have, have any breaches reported that involve medical device vendors? Uh, well, in, in terms of the breach question, um, folks are welcome to check our web portal, our health breach reporting tool, which we recently revamped uh, the design of um, to see breaches that are reported. Now, what's hard about searching that database is that, again, we don't have a separate category called medical device vendor. We have healthcare provider um, category and we have business associate category. Um, we also, of course, have a health plan and a healthcare clearinghouse authority consistent with our the, the um, scope of our authority. So you'd really have to take a look. Um, we investigate breaches of over 500 records that are reported to us, and when we hear about a breach, such as in the newspaper, that we don't get or see a report, we look into it. Um, the one thing I will say about our audits, so we have under the High Tech Legislation Authority to conduct HIPAA audits of entities that are covered by our rules, and we've had an audit ongoing now for a little over a year. Um, because that audit is still in progress, um, those are all open cases, and we don't comment on them. So um, it's possible that there might be um, a device vendor in the mix. We choose among covered entities and business associates anonymously from our database, um, but we didn't target them. Um, and as to whether or not we will sort of do something very focused on device manufacturers, I think it's a little bit premature to say. We're going to take a look at what we get out of this second phase of the audit program and um, work with our new uh, director who was appointed in March um, and figure out where, um, where we want to focus on a going forward basis. And have those, uh, you know, with this next phase of audits, has that started yet or is that getting ready to kick off? Well, no, we are, um, you know, so what we've been calling phase two of our high-tech audit program began um, about a year ago, actually, mm -hmm. almost to the date. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and we, and we have covered entities and business associates included, um, approximately 215 entities in total. That's the one that's still underway, um, and so it's really premature to talk about where the next audit program is going. We do, though, anticipate a, a lot of entities who are involved in that audit have already received their individual reports back from us about how um, what we saw in reviewing the documentation that they submitted. Um, we expect to be completing um, the audits of, of the covered entities and the business associates um, by the end of the of the calendar year, and then we'll, ah. we'll yes, we'll be issuing a, a roll up report, basically a summary of what 
some of the patterns that we've seen, both good and bad, um, that won't identify any particular entity who was in the audit, but will um, will focus on sectors um, that were represented in the audit to the extent that there are findings to report that are sector specific. Okay, great. Definitely something uh, to look forward to. Yeah, right around Christmas, isn't that nice? Yes. <laughs> <A nice gift. laughs> if, if we can get it done in time. <laughs> there you go. That's a gift. Uh, so now, Linda, I I have a, a question for you um, that caused a little bit of intrigue. I had some folks uh, notify me, and they said, "Hey." Did you know that the FDA has a website page called the FDA's Role in Medical Device Cybersecurity FDA Fact Sheet? And there's a statement in there that talks about how the FDA works closely with several federal government agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security, in addition to the private sector, medical device manufacturers, healthcare delivery organizations, uh, researchers, and end users, and so on. So I've heard from several of the medical device folks, and also from healthcare providers, uh, particularly the information security officers and privacy officers, they're asking about that link and communication you have with the, the Department of Homeland Security. So I'm wondering, can you explain the type of coordination that FDA has with the Department of Homeland Security? And given our current um, environment of hacking throughout the world, have you ever participated in any investigations or found evidence of hacking or attempted hacking of medical devices from nation states such as Russia, China, or other countries? Uh, sure. So uh, FDA does have relationships with many federal partners. Um, DHS is certainly one of our relationships. And the Department of Homeland Security is responsible for protecting critical infrastructure, which will include cybersecurity. Um, in that role, they uh, run the Industrial Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team, also known as ICS CERT. Um, ICS CERT handles emergency response, investigates vulnerabilities, and coordinates with um, those who report them along with the manufacturer. Uh, this is the group that um, handles uh, vulnerability reports for medical devices. Um, now, this is not to say that the FDA doesn't handle those vulnerability reports as well, but um, FDA gets involved when there is um, uh, safety or effectiveness questions and um, ICS CERT is looking at it from critical infrastructure. So we do work very closely with them and coordinate with them um, uh, to the uh, extent where we're like investigating vulnerabilities. So they've been um, a wonderful uh, partner with us and, and we have um, a nice working relationship with them and communicate with them regularly. Um, as to whether or not there are um, nation states that are uh, hacking our medical systems, uh, I believe Steve um, mentioned that uh, he's seen evidence that that does happen. You know, certainly that is um, an important component about trying to figure out where the attacks are coming from. Uh, but also looking at this from a, a purely FDA perspective, we are focused on making sure that the devices are securable and that they maintain their security in the field, you know, regardless of who is trying to hack in. So I anticipate if you do have any indication of that or question about that, that's also when you bring the Department of Homeland Security in so they can kind of address that point while you address the, the safety issues of the devices? Certainly there would be other people that would be very interested in, mm -hmm. in nation state hacking um, uh, above my pay grade for sure. So it sounds very intriguing. It sounds like uh, the stuff of a good novel that we might see someday. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so okay, well great. Well, I have a couple more questions for each of you in the, the last uh, five, six minutes that we have now. Um, Devin, a question I hear all the time and almost literally for the past several years now, do you anticipate any changes to the HIPAA regulations anytime soon? And in particular, 
we've had the notice of proposed rulemaking for the accounting of disclosures rule that's been out there for a while. And of course, that's going to have an impact to medical devices since it has to do with who's getting access to the data and so on. If, you know, the, the data for the medical device, um, it falls under that. So uh, just wondering, what can you tell us about any changes to the HIPAA regs in general and also to the notice of proposed rulemaking for the accounting of disclosures rule in particular? Yeah, so let me start with the last one first. Um, okay. On the accounting of disclosures changes that are mandated by high tech, uh, we do not have plans to finalize that proposed rulemaking. I, I know I'm, we have talked about this in different contexts. Um, however, it remains a requirement uh, that we need to fulfill, that we have to find some way of enabling individuals to receive accounting of disclosures not access necessarily, but disclosures of health information for treatment, payment, and operations um, from uh, electronic health records as defined in high tech. So I think we're going to need some additional public input on how we can implement this, given that what we had initially proposed um, was not feasible. Um, and we're hoping that folks will give us uh, some good ideas through a uh, um, a public comment process such as an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. So that's coming. Uh, in terms of whether there are other changes um, that are likely, um, you know, keep in mind we have another high tech provision that we need to implement um, to come up with a methodology to share um, penalties and settlement funds with individuals who are harmed um, by violations of the HIPAA regulations. And on top of that, you know, there is an, uh, an administration wide effort uh, to look at all regulations and determine whether there are provisions that ought to be modified or eliminated. Uh, in circumstances where they impose burdens that are out of sync uh, with the benefits that they generate. Great. So with regard to all these different things, then it would, as it applies directly to medical devices, I think uh, especially when you, you come out with a new notice of proposed rulemaking and have, um, have it open for feedback, that's when the medical device folks will have an opportunity to give their input on it as far as the accounting of disclosures and how the data is uh, collected or generated for that. And also for the hospital systems and uh, the information security officers like Mitch, you know, to have, he can provide input on what would help him as a, a hospital security officer as well. So. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I do hope that folks will um, submit uh, some comments on that. I, I, you know, I think it could be out before the end of this calendar year, but the timing on that is a little, um, is a little uncertain, but it is coming. Ah, okay. So you won't give us two presents around the end of the year in the holidays. God, I hope not. I mean, really, I will try. It, 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 it that's painful. I recognize that. So. <laughs> Okay, well, well, excellent. So thank you for that information. Appreciate that. And Linda, so at the FDA um, and all the comments you get from medical device vendors and also from those who use the medical devices, I'm wondering what what are a couple maybe of the most amazing or surprising types of questions or statements that you've gotten from medical device vendors or engineers or manufacturers about the need to build cybersecurity or privacy controls into the medical devices? I mean, is there anything that has really captured your attention? Uh, sure. So certainly, and some of this came up in today's discussion um, when I hear that uh, there's there's um, folklore that uh, security is is not legally required, um, mm -hmm. and the FDA uh, you know only issued these guidances, and guidances are not legally binding. While it's true that guidance documents are, are not legally binding, and they provide our current thinking with regards to um, a particular topic, it is not true that uh, security. Uh, is not required as part of um, uh, device uh, evaluation and, and or device before you um, you know when you're out on the market, and the reason is that uh, the FDA is charged with um, assuring safety and effectiveness of devices, 
there is a huge overlap between security and safety. So by saying that um, security is not important, you are indicating that um, uh, there's, there's a, a piece of your device that's not safe. Now, safety and effectiveness are well covered in the regulations, um, and security as being part of safety, uh, therefore, is not voluntary, and we do expect all manufacturers to assess the security of their device because it does impact the safety and effectiveness. So, um, our guidance documents, while um, voluntary, only provide our current thinking. Um, and it, it provides um, a roadmap for how we think manufacturers can address security considerations within the, our regulatory um, oversight. And we certainly encourage everyone to do it uh, at the initial design phase and throughout the life cycle of the device. Um, but uh, the assessment of security is definitely included in our assessment of safety. Great. Well, that is very good to hear, and I hope everybody out there is listening closely when you said that, so there is absolutely no question in anybody's mind now that they do need to address uh, security, uh, data security of those devices as well as physical security. Um, now, for the next few minutes, uh, you know, I, I really liked having our roundtable. We're at the end of our, our roundtable discussion time, so I want to to pass along two questions for uh, both of you, Devin and Linda, but also anybody else who's been on our panel today. Uh, there's a couple that I was kind of intrigued by, and I would appreciate hearing from any of you on this. So one of the questions was, what role does blockchain have in medical device controls, not only for security, but also for data transfer and so on? Have any of you thought about or worked with blockchain as it applies to medical device security? Yeah, this is Steve, and uh, I'll, I'll jump in there, uh, Rebecca. Sure. It's, it's something that's getting a little bit of discussion. Uh, it would have more potential, I believe, in uh, limiting the ability of uh, cyber criminals to steal data. Because, you know, think of it as distributed ledger, it's the same type of uh, technology used for bitcoins, where it creates something that's essentially untraceable, unless there's one entity that has control over a certain number of the ledgers, if you will. But uh, I'm certainly not an expert on it. It's something that uh, I've looked into somewhat, but it uh, really has some promise uh, or some at least opportunities to be applied that would make it much more difficult for a given cyber criminal to steal patient data. So it's good to know that uh, that folks are looking at that right now then. So so that is great to hear. And um, I can also answer that as well. This yeah. is Mitch Parker. So we've looked at blockchain as well, and we look at it more for having a purpose with data clearinghouses and also data interchange and how it could potentially supplement and augment health information exchanges, but also at the same time, you have the issue of you can't let one person have too much control or else they can actually alter the blockchain. And mm -hmm. how do you also handle certain events where you, how do you handle rollback? Mm -hmm. And those are some questions that have to be answered before I think blockchain can be really successful. So that will be definitely a good topic to, to keep an eye on going forward. I, I see it talked about more and more. And I have one more before I go to the wrap-up for the event. Uh, kind of, you know, you mentioned, Mitch, about exchange of data. Well, uh, kind of a segue into that, the question is, are there any data exchange standards that are evolving within the industry right now? Or are we going to continue dealing with islands of proprietary data formats that the different uh, medical device manufacturers and different types of devices are going to continue to use? Hi, this is Dave Saunders. And uh, you know, I'll tell you our perspective. You know, uh, the whole point of the internet is and always has been interoperability. And so I, I feel really uh, uncomfortable with the concept of internet of medical things if we do not foresee uh, some level of interoperability between medical devices in the future. 
In fact, I see in our guest list, uh, we have somebody attending who is an expert in this field that's actually been working with uh, protocol standards between devices uh, being controlled by interlock devices. Um, you know, as I said earlier, there's, there's a lot of benefit if we've got people participating in the Internet of Things, making devices that can be perhaps controlled by another device that is just, you know, made uh, perhaps to coordinate information between an EEG and a pulse oximeter and some other type of sensor device. Um, if we don't have standards to make that possible, then Internet of Things is nothing but an archipelago of disconnected islands that just happen to look like they're in the same geophysical region. Good point. Yeah, and this is Steve, and I'll add to that. Uh, yeah, certainly correct. There are interoperability standards. Uh, we actually participate, other manufacturers participate in events called Connectathons to uh, make sure that devices interact properly. And it's kind of interesting that the first uh, engineering types that got involved in medical device cybersecurity were the interoperability people. So before we had full-time cybersecurity people, the uh, engineering people that would dabble in cybersecurity were the interoperability engineers because there are obviously security, authentication implications between uh, interoperating devices. So that's really where medical device cybersecurity got its start. Great. And uh, just one more quick question before I go to the wrap-up. And this, uh, Katina, if you're still there, any thoughts on ransomware? Uh, what you Have you seen anything with your research into these upcoming and emerging, uh, especially embeddable medical devices that you've done any work with? Sure. In 2010, we hosted a conference at Wollongong. We had Mark Gasson from the University of Reading come and demonstrate uh, an SQL injection code virus into his implantable chip. Mm. And many people said, well, if you can do that in the outside world, of course you can do that in the embedded world. But the risk in the embedded world is that you're impacting the individual either through a healthcare issue uh, or really death by internet. And we have had a lot of stories surface more recently about alleged attacks on pacemaker devices. Of course you'd never know because the person would be rendered dead. Um, but these devices start to escalate in terms of, because of the invasiveness of the embedded devices and the pervasive nature of the embedded devices, the actual cybersecurity risks are greater. We would argue not about risk analysis so much, but about exposure analysis, a, a new area of research oh. where, where we're looking at, and looking at how you've got a technology configuration, as, as Linda and Devin both said, and how do engineers build more robust systems that have less potentiality to be accessed via some kind of cybersecurity issue through viruses, and we're talking computer viruses now that can be, you know, wireless, wirelessly transmitted, or when someone does, you know, something with a transaction, for instance, if they have an embedded device. So interesting future, but massive cybersecurity issues and technology configuration issues to discuss. Massive indeed. So thank you all so very much for participating today. Uh, if we'll go to the next slide, I'll start the wrap up here in the last eight minutes.